Praise the Lord. It's just so good to be here with you on Palm Sunday. Uh, as the children have so uh, cutely illustrated, uh, this is the day that we remember Jesus' arrival to Jerusalem and the beginning of his Passion Week. And like Hayes alluded to, next week. So we're looking forward to next week, right? Starting this week, this is the week of uh, Christ's Passion. But we're looking forward to next week. It is the most important event in all of human history that we're going to celebrate next week. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Uh, I say this all the time. This is the most important event, especially for us who are Christians, because it is the hope that we have as Christians in the resurrection of Jesus, that we too will have resurrection life through him. And so his sacrifice for our sin was accepted, and therefore by faith in him we have forgiveness and newness of life. And so I, I encourage everybody that's here this morning, if you come back next week to celebrate Easter with us and the resurrection of Jesus, I just want to invite everybody back next week as well. Uh, Brother Dave, I believe, will be back with us next week. You know, uh, I was thinking, as we were thinking about this time of the passion, of what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jesus' death and resurrection is the foundation for our salvation. And if we confess that by faith, we are saved. We are included in the forgiveness that Jesus provided for us on the cross. And so this morning, like I said, we're looking at the events that occur on the Sunday before the resurrection, what we traditionally call Palm Sunday, uh, just like the children illustrated. Now, I don't have a, a whole lot of time. Um, I, sometimes I tend to be long-winded, but we have a fresh start graduation to get to, and we're going to do that at the end. So don't give me, yeah, praise the Lord. We get to... We get to celebrate what Jesus has done in the lives of these Fresh Start graduates uh, as a result of what he did for us on the cross and through his resurrection and this newness of life. Eleven guys and two men are going to be uh, graduating, so we'll, I want to make sure and leave plenty of time uh, for that. I'm sorry, what? Two women, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please, please forgive me. Yeah, okay, yes. Two Two women. All right. Praise the Lord. Thanks for y'all's grace. Okay. Um, so, and again, before I jump into the, the message uh, this morning, I want to encourage everybody this week, as we look forward to Easter next week, to read the passion narrative in the Gospels. And I encourage you to read it maybe in, in uh, two, three, or all of them. In fact, I've got those passages of Scripture if you want to jot them down. So this week I encourage everybody, and Brother Dave wanted me to encourage you, to read the, the uh, passion narrative Jesus, about Jesus' death and his resurrection. In Matthew, it's found in chapters 26 to 28. In Mark, it's found in chapters 14 to 16. In Luke, it's found in chapters 22 to 24, and then in John, starting in chapter 18 to chapter 20. So again, I just want to encourage you to meditate on what Jesus has done this week. And we should all year long, right? But especially this week as we remember uh, His goodness and His grace through His Son, Jesus. Let's open up a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you and praise you for uh, all that you've done, dear God, all that you've uh, the grace and the mercy that you've shown us, dear Lord. I just uh, thank you for everybody that's here, dear God. I just pray that you prepare our hearts and our minds as we reflect on what you have done for us. And we just give you praise and glorify your name. I pray that everything that's done and said would glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so if you want to turn with me to Matthew, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 21 this morning. We're going to look at... Palm Sunday. And we may actually look at the accounts in some of the uh, other Gospels as well. 
And this morning I hope to bring out some things. I know most of us, if you've grown up in church, you've heard the story of Palm Sunday. But I hope to point out a few things that maybe we just haven't really thought about as much, uh, but just gives us a deeper understanding and revelation of who God is and what He's done for us through His Son, Jesus. So we're going to be in uh, Matthew 21, and I'm just going to read starting in verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. And this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed crying out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So a couple of things I want to look at and think about this morning. First off, some of you may have wondered, Why is Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. How many of you ever really thought about that? And I just wonder why Jesus would be riding in on a donkey. Normally, the, the pilgrims that would be coming to Jerusalem, they would typically be walking, and if anything, they might have a donkey carrying some of their stuff, but they wouldn't necessarily be riding in a donkey. So why is Jesus riding into Jerusalem on this donkey? Well, Matthew tells us exactly why Jesus is riding in on a donkey. Uh, well, first off, I want to point out something. Jesus sends his disciples into a town to gather this donkey. Now, this illustrates a couple of things. Either Jesus knew ahead of time that there was going to be a donkey, so he's showing that he is the Son of God and that he had foreknowledge that there would be a donkey and that they would let him take this donkey. Or, this is another possibility, Jesus had prearranged for this donkey for his use, and so they knew that when he sent somebody to come get it, they were going to let him take this donkey. But still, that doesn't answer the question, why is this so important? Why is this so insignificant that the uh, gospel writers would include this in the story? And the reason why is because Jesus is consciously fulfilling a prophecy from the Old Testament. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, in fact, I want you all, if you, if you can, flip back there with me. Zechariah, just a few books before Matthew. Zechariah chapter 9, in verse 9. It says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this is a prophecy about the coming Messiah. Uh, the Jews recognized this prophecy as a prophecy of the, their coming Savior, the anointed one, the Messiah. And so Jesus is conscientiously, I mean on purpose, fulfilling This prophecy about the Messiah. So what is he declaring to the people at this point? That he is the promised Messiah. You know, a lot of the people uh, at this time were frustrated. Some of the Jewish leaders would tell Jesus, just tell us plainly, who are you? And, And, you know, stop talking in parables and riddles. But Jesus here, I mean, so clearly points to the fact that he is the promised Messiah. He's the one that Zechariah was pointing to that would ride into Jerusalem lowly and riding on a donkey. Now, here's the other thing, just kind of show you who Jesus is. This is a donkey that nobody else has ridden on. Now, 
I mean, I don't know a whole lot about riding horses and donkeys. But if you're going to ride a donkey or a horse into a crowded area where everybody's going to be shouting, I don't know that I would want to ride one that nobody's ever ridden on before. I, you know, I just, that's just me. I, I mean, I may be completely wrong, but Jesus, he's showing that he has power over nature. He has power over everything. And so this, this donkey that he chooses to ride, never been ridden, but Jesus is the promised one. He is the Messiah. And now, I think we can learn a few things by looking at this prophecy in Zechariah. So first off, it says that we should rejoice. Now, the people, didn't they rejoice when Jesus came in? They were shouting Hosanna. We're going to look at that a little bit more in just a second. So we are instructed to rejoice when we see the Messiah coming. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. And now, look, it says, Behold, your king is coming to you. Now, this shows us something about the Messiah. The Messiah comes to us. He initiates relationship with us. We didn't have to seek after him. Jesus said that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He initiated relationship with us. He is the coming one. He comes to us. And what we, what we're, our response then is to rejoice and to receive him by faith. But he doesn't make us seek after him. You know, but that's a lot of times human nature. We try to seek after God. We try to do everything we can to initiate relationship with God when he has initiated it first. He loved us first, and our response is just to love him back. So he is our coming king. He initiates relationship with us. Why? Because he loves us. He wasn't, and here's the other thing, he wasn't compelled or forced to come. I mean, you can't compel or force the Son of God to do anything. He came on his own initiative because he loves us. He came to seek and to save the lost, because he is the good shepherd. He is our good king. He is our righteous king. He comes to us. And look, not only that, but look where he's riding into. He's riding into Jerusalem where he knows full well what is going to happen to him. He could, he could have turned around at any moment uh, and, and said, no, nope, not going to do it. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to uh, go through this ridicule, this physical and spiritual anguish for these people who, who don't even fully understand who I am, don't appreciate who I am. He could have done that. But out of his love, he continued to come to us into Jerusalem where he knew what was going to happen. So he's the coming king. And then not only that, but it says he is righteous and having salvation. He is the righteous one. He is perfectly just and righteous. In fact, we see in the death of Jesus on the cross, God's justice and his righteousness fulfilled because Jesus took the penalty of our sin on himself. But we also see the love of Jesus demonstrated. Why? Because he took it in our place. So we see the justice and the righteousness. And not only that, but we see the salvation that he has. Salvation that we can only have through faith in Jesus. So he's the coming king. He's righteous. And he has salvation. And this last thing, he's lowly and riding on a donkey. When we think of a conquering king coming into a city, uh, in, you know, a secular conquering king, we don't think of them coming in hum humbly, lowly, do we? We think of them typically riding on a big stallion, right? A lot of pomp and circumstance. Everybody, you know, shouting for the conquering king. That's what we typically think of when we think of a worldly king coming in as a conquering king. But that's not how Jesus came in. He came in in humility. He, a conquering king, would have come in on the backs of his subjects, so to speak. If, if, he just got, if the king just got through wanting, winning a, a, a military victory, who was it that fought the military battle for the king and died for the king? It was the people, right? 
The people would have been the ones that would have gone out and sacrificed their lives for the king. But that's not the case with Jesus. With Jesus, the king came to sacrifice his life for the people. See, completely opposite. And so he won the victory for us rather than we having to earn the victory for the king. So it's completely opposite of what we would expect of a conquering king. Now, we do call this the triumphal entry, but it's not a triumphal entry like the world defines it. It was a triumph of humility over pride. It was a triumph of righteousness over sin, of grace over condemnation, of life over death. And that was the victory that Jesus came to win. That was the conquering king who came to win victory for his people, to give his life for us. He gives his life, this king gives his life for his subjects. And he did it by humbling himself. I I love what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. He says that he, speaking of Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus humbles himself And as he humbles himself, he wins the victory over sin, death, and the grave. So it is truly a triumphal victory, a triumphal entry as Jesus comes into Jerusalem. Not like we would expect, but it truly is, especially for all who, again, have put our faith and trust in the work that Jesus has done for us. So Matthew points back to this, uh, in, uh, back to Matthew uh, chapter 21. He says, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey. Now, let's look at what the people say as Jesus is coming in to Jerusalem. In uh, verse 9 in Matthew 21, it says, And the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So they're crying Hosanna to the Son of David. Now this word Hosanna uh, originally, originally meant Lord save us. Originally, Hosanna meant Lord save us. Now, uh, by the time of the first century, it was just basically a shout of praise to God. All right? But originally, this meant Lord save us. So when the people were crying Hosanna, they they were praising God for his salvation. Now, where does this quote come from? Uh, Matthew is actually quoting, again, from the Old Testament. This is actually a quote from uh, Psalm 118. Now, Psalm, starting in chapter 113 to 118, was called the Egyptian Hallel, which was basically a praise for God's deliverance of the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. And so it became part of their tradition that as they were coming into Jerusalem to celebrate these feasts, to celebrate what God had done, they would sing these psalms. And they would sing praise to God. And so on this occasion, though, as Jesus is walking in, they're singing this psalm, praising God for His provision, for His salvation, as He had provided for them in coming out of Egypt. Now I want to go back and let's look back at Psalm 118. So I'd like for everybody to turn there and let's look at this the end of this what we call Egyptian Hallel, this praise to God for the provision that he had made for his people. So Psalm 118. I want to read the whole thing, but for the sake of time let's just read a few of the verses. Uh, let's start in verse 19. Everybody with me? So Psalm 118, starting at verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness, 
I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. Let's just stop there for a second. So again, this is foreshadowing the salvation that would be brought through Jesus. And so look at verse 19 again. Open to me the gates of righteousness. Are we the ones who open the gates of righteousness? No, they're open for us. And so Jesus is opening the gates of righteousness for his people. We're not the ones who are opening the gates of righteousness. And then our response then is what? To go through them. And I will go through them and I will praise the Lord for his provision, for his righteousness. And so verse 20, this is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. And who is that gate? Jesus makes it pretty clear in uh, John chapter 10. Who is that gate that we enter through? The only gate? Jesus. He is the only gate. He's the only way to come to, Christ, to, come to God is through him. And so he says, through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Everything that we just read, Jesus is the fulfillment of the celebration that they were celebrating here. Now, uh, we look back at the Exodus event. The Exodus event, we've been learning in my Old Testament uh, survey class in Sunday school, that the Exodus event was the redemptive event of God in the Old Testament. Because God redeemed his people Israel from bondage and slavery out of Egypt and brought them to the promised land. But that redemption that was foreshadowed in the Old Testament, is now going to be fulfilled in the New Testament through the work of Jesus. So now, instead of uh, freeing us from the bondage of slavery, now he's freeing us from the bondage of sin and giving us a new life in him. So Jesus is the fulfillment. And as a result, we're now righteous because of what Jesus has done. Now we can enter, he's talking about here, entering into the temple into the presence of God? Well, now through Christ, through his righteousness, we can enter into the presence of God, right? Because of what he has done. And so we praise him for it. And so he says in verse 21, I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. And Jesus is the fulfillment. Look, now look at verse 22. This is a passage I know you've heard before because they quote it in the New Testament. It says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but it's part of human nature to try to earn salvation. We want to try to put God in our debt. Like, I've been a good boy, God, so now you owe me. You know, that, that's, that's human, that's man's way of trying to reach God. But we already said that Jesus is the king who comes to us. All right, he's the one who initiates salvation. And so we can't put God in our debt. Instead, God's plan of redemption that, is that he would come and he would win salvation for us by sacrificing himself. And, our, and we put faith in what he has done. It's not by works of righteousness that we're justified before God, but it's because of what Jesus has done. And so this idea that the, the stone which the builders rejected, many of the first century Jews were trying to earn salvation, trying to earn right standing with God by following the law. But Jesus turns all that upside down on its head. He says, instead, I'm going to provide a way. I'm going to be the salvation for my people. And he said in verse 23, this was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. It, 
You know what you wind up with when you try to earn salvation on your own? You wind up with frustration and eventually despair and hopelessness. But when we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus... We now can rejoice because we know that the victory has been won on our part, in our place. Um, We we look to God's way, and it's marvelous in our eyes. And in verse 24, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So we can rejoice now as we look back at Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem to pay the price for our sins, something that we can never do on our own. But then he doesn't stay in the grave. He is resurrected. So we know that the sacrifice for our sin is complete and accepted. And so what do we do? We cry out with the people, Hosanna, save us, O Lord. We're just, we're recognizing our need of a Savior. We can't do it on our own. We need you. So we're going to cry out, save us, O Lord, Hosanna. But then we can do it from the perspective of a post crucifixion post-resurrection and so for us it becomes a, a, a cry of praise for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus and so he comes in the name of the Lord what do we mean when we say that Jesus is coming in the name of the Lord he's coming with the authority and the power of God himself He's coming with the authority and the power of God himself. And not only that, but the character of the Lord. We saw in Zechariah 9.9 that he's righteous and he's just having salvation with him. So Jesus comes with the authority and the character of God himself. Now, the last thing I want to cover is what was the response to Jesus, to the triumphal entry? In Matthew some of the people that we just read said, who is this? They were wondering, who is this guy that everybody's, that everybody's crying praise to? And many of them said, oh, this is a prophet. You know, this is a prophet uh, from Galilee, you know. And that is not a sufficient answer. They did not truly understand who he was. I mean, like we've already said, Jesus is purposely, conscientiously fulfilling the prophecy For the coming Messiah. So it would be a mistake to categorize Jesus as just some prophet or moral teacher. He is so much more than that. He is Lord. He is God come in the flesh. He is the coming Messiah. The anointed one. And so by them answering that question. Oh he's a prophet or just some moral teacher. He is so much more than that. You know C.S. Lewis Uh, put it this way, nobody could claim what Jesus claimed to be the Son of God and still be called a good moral person. Because to claim to be the Son of God, you're either the Son of God or you're a liar or you're a lunatic. You're just crazy. Okay, So he's either one of the two and we have to make a decision what is going to be our response to who Jesus proclaims himself to be. Is he going to be our Lord or are we just going to consider him a liar or just a lunatic. The people here had an insufficient understanding of who Jesus was by saying he was just a prophet from Galilee. He is so much more. He is the King. He is the Lord who has come for us to provide salvation for us. Now, in Luke 19, uh, verses 39 to 40, um, if you don't have to turn there, But Luke 19, verses 39 to 40, this is the same story that uh, Luke uh, tells about Jesus coming. And this is the Pharisees' response. It says, And some of the Pharisees called to him, Jesus, from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. (laughs) You know, if that doesn't tell you who Jesus is, uh, right there, when the Pharisees tried to to uh, squelch the praise of Jesus, he says, look, this is the day the Lord has made. He's the one who arranged all of this. This is the day that he has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And he says, if the people, if the people don't rejoice, he says the stones themselves are going to cry out in rejoicing. You see, there's nothing that they could do to, to hinder the praise that was due Jesus. He is worthy. Of praise. 
And this was the day that God had orchestrated that Jesus would come in to Jerusalem to carry out our plan of salvation. So, I mean, again, that's just showing you that Jesus is so much more than just a good teacher or, or, or a moral philosopher. He is Lord. He is the Son of God. The stones would cry out immediately. Now, even though his disciples, and if we read in John, even his disciples uh, were a little bit confused at this point, at least from their perspective. Um, you know, they, uh, in fact, in John chapter 12, let me just read this real quick. It says in verse 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. So even his disciples right at first didn't understand. But John, in writing his gospel, he's looking back at the events of this week from a post-crucifixion, post-resurrection, post-glorification of Jesus. And so now he recognizes what was happening in this week, what was happening at the triumphal entry. And we have that same perspective. So that we can join in with the disciples. And celebrate the victory. That was won for us. In our place. By what Jesus has done. We can give him praise and honor. For his, his grace and his mercy. And his sacrifice. He came in humbly. To die. Now, he will come back a second time, and the second time he comes back again, he's going to be riding that, that steed, that, that horse, okay? Uh, he's going to come in as a conquering king, but this time he came in in humility in order to take our place to die for us in our place so that we could have salvation through him, so that we could be the righteousness of God in Christ because of the work that he's done. And so we can praise the Lord for his humility and his sacrifice and then the restored relationship that we have with God through him. It was God's plan of redemption that Jesus won for us. This week, I just encourage you to read through the passion narrative, to read through what Jesus has done. To just take time out of our busy schedule. I know we're all busy. But we need to take time out to give God thanks. To praise Him for all that He's done. And then I encourage you to be a witness of that to those of us, to those people who are around you. Be a witness of what Jesus has done. Tell them, look, I was, a, I was a slave to sin. Those of you who are graduating today, you can tell people uh, that you after you go back home, I was a slave to sin, but God set me free through what Jesus has done. And, and so, and, I'm a, and we can tell of the wonderful works that Jesus has done in our lives. And then encourage people, invite people to come next Sunday as we remember the resurrection, the hope that we have in Jesus.